We had a fairly decent week. I finished up with Harvest. Almost in time for 4th of July. Does everyone have a good holiday week, middle of the week? Holiday hump day is what it was, wasn't it? <laughs> I know it is kind of quiet. You guys, yeah, let's, let's fix that a little bit. Like, make some noise, jump up, bounce around, do some jumping jacks. So, uh, but God's not dead, so let's not be dead here this morning. Let's get up and look alive. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. When love's so bold, to see a revolution somehow. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. You guys like cowbell? <laughs> All right. Cool. So does Roy.
You know, uh, this song's been requested quite a bit over the last couple months. And I think uh, I was really thinking about why I kept not, not wanting to play it. And I think I just hit a little too close to home. I've been uh, struggling a lot myself with uh, negative thoughts. I've been trying to apply the lessons that Scott's been teaching and diving a little bit more into the Word and just speaking life over my troubles and situations. Sometimes I feel successful, sometimes I don't. But we need to take those thoughts, those, that fear, and just cast it aside and hold tight onto the Word of God. He told you you're not good enough. He told you you're not right. He told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight. When he told you you're not worthy. When he told you you're not loved. When he told you you're not beautiful. You never be enough.
couple of months, if any of you remember. I know I'm not always good at remembering what Larry or Dave shares, but I've been sharing out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I know I've said this before, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 is really the greatest exposition on giving in the whole Bible. If you'll study that, you'll see God's heart for giving. And I've been sharing in verse 7, 8, uh, out of 2 Corinthians 9. and You know, God is simple. He, he has a couple of requirements when we give. And he says in verse 7, he says, purpose in your heart what you're going to give. In other words, you're supposed to think about, consider, and pray about what you're going to give. And then the second thing he requires is to be a cheerful giver. To be, you know, and that means to be willing. I like... I like Exodus 35, 5, it says, He who is of a willing heart, let him bring an offering to the Lord. You know, they were building the temple. Moses had to tell the people, quit bringing in the stuff. We got more than we need to build the temple. But when we will do those two things, it'll set in motion God working on your behalf in the area of your finances and every area of your life. And I'm going to paraphrase verse 8, but, you know, basically he says you're going to have everything you need in this life, and you're going to have leftovers to give to other good works. But see, here's the cool thing about God. It says in verse 10, it says, He supplies, it says, He who supplies seed to the sower, that means your tithes and offering. God supplies that. And it says bread for food. You know, not only bread, but Malachi 3.10, it says there'll be meat in your house when you bring the tithes and offerings in too. So God supplies everything we need to give. And if we will have that purpose in our heart and be willing, be that cheerful giver, God will begin to operate in your life in that area. And finally, it says, um, He will supply and multiply the seed you've sown and increase, increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now that word righteousness there means charitable deeds. So God says, I'm gonna increase the fruits. I'm gonna increase the effect of your giving, your charitable deeds. And he says, I will make your generosity have a lasting effect in people's lives. And that's so powerful. God does it all for us. We just gotta have the willing heart to bring our offering to the Lord. So. I hope you'll walk in that. So let's pray and we're going to take up offerings. So, Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful we get to give back into your kingdom, Lord God. Give us a willing heart, a cheerful heart, Father God. Uh, just thank you, Lord, that our, our giving is a form of worship, a form of just exalting and honoring your name, Lord, by giving back, Father. We do pray that the Word of God would become alive for each and every one of us in here, Lord, that you would bless and multiply our seed and just increase the effect of that in people's lives, Lord God. We thank you for that in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
strength And Jesus reigns in this place Showers of mercy and grace Going on every place There's freedom
Take some hands, hug some people. I know you're glad to see them this morning real quick. You guys are so friendly. I said greet, you never stop. I ain't talking to you. I gotta talk to you. I gotta like talk to you for another 20 minutes. No. It is good to see you guys this morning. How many of you guys are excited to be live at Church Live? It is good to see you. I'm gonna go through a quick, real quick, a couple things. In your weekly bulletins, there's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> so it's kinda like one of those magazines when you buy and all everything falls out, you open it up. Ah! But um, we got Backpack Carnival. Here's all the school supplies. That's coming around the corner. There's a sign-up sheet for those who would like to help. We got a lot of stuff going on. What are you rolling your eyes up over there? Okay. As long as you're rolling your eyes at that, not me. I was like, my gosh, what did I do? But, uh, um, but anyways, look at it. This is stuff that if you want to donate, it's always, this is the one of the greatest events that we do every year. It's just a lot of work. Um, in the back row of the church, to the right, always to the right, and you never miss them unless they disappear, but they're always to the right. In the back row. That's like Eric Palmer's seat. He's going to put a name, burn his name into that seat pretty soon. But in there is a meet and greet that uh, I get dizzy when they're not here. Like, whoa, the building doesn't seem right. There's a meet and greet that Rhonda and Barbara and them put together for the new baby, Delilah, back there. Um, and so the information is right there. They didn't do a baby shower. Um, waiting for the baby to be born, so now you can shower the baby. And um, beautiful baby. Definitely takes after the mom on that one. So meet, meet, so be there and support that and meet the family. Another thing I'm doing, I'm getting ready for, let me tell you something. This has been a great summer. I know it's busy. It's funny, I, I love watching people. Um, not like a creeper, but I love watching people in general. You watch me go through seasons. In summertime, everybody's got this dizzy look to their eyes. It doesn't matter when you see them, like, whoa, man, so what's going on? And uh, this summer, I've been spending a lot of time praying. Here's what I'm going to tell you as your pastor is I believe that by fall, I mean, I think there's going to be a great place to, or a great thing that happens to Church Alive in the fall, but with God's kingdom, more importantly. God's really doing something in, in Cheyenne County. I, I mean, because I look from season to season where we're at. And so I've been taking a lot of time praying this summer and getting ready for fall. And one of the things I felt like I wanted to do is in your weekly is a list of sermon stuff. Now, Paul says, you know, without vision, people perish. Paul also says, you know, his tongue was the rudder of the ship. And I believe a church that's not going somewhere is a church going nowhere. How many of you guys would agree with that? And for three years, I'm going to tell you, for three years when we started this church, we have built, in my mind, we've built an amazing base. And we know great people, great people are loving God. People are growing all the time. I mean, just by leaves and bounds, Dawn, three years ago, wasn't doing youth ministry now. She is doing youth ministry. She prays more now than she ever has because she's doing youth ministry. She came to me, when I don't know if you remember this, when she first came to the church, she came and she said, I would really like to learn how to pray more, you know, and so she does youth ministry. It's like learning how to shoot a gun when you go to war. You get that, you're going to learn quick. So, 
But, um, but just to see the growth in so many people, um, I'm excited. We have a great, healthy base. And so I believe by fall, we're just going to see an increase with that. Um, because what I don't see is just the people coming to church. I see people hungry and ready to do something. I see a base of leaders. And that's what I see. And that's where we're going to go this next year, starting the fall. So what I did here is these are, in, these are directions I want to go over the next nine months, when September, during the school year, these are things I feel like we should teach on as a church that I prayed about and I feel like. Love Talk I put in there just because a lot of you have told me I want to do that again, um, you know, but just different direction. I mean, we can't teach the same stuff, but marriage and stuff like that. So up top I put two books of the Bible that I feel is crucial to teach on. And I feel like as a church it's important to teach on the Bible, obviously. And so the book of Luke and book of Acts written by the same author, one, Luke wrote the works of Jesus Christ. The book of Acts is the works of the church empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if you want to be a healthy church, we need to follow Acts. Because we're, we're a satellite church from Acts. And so I put those two books there, and then topicals, marriage and family. I mean, the crucial, the deal is that I've watched so many people, I'll say it like this boldly, people that struggle with going to church and, and serving God and, and surrendering life, a lot of times I have found through counseling, they have family dynamic issues. And so family and, and teaching, how to be married, how to be those things. So these are all topical stuff. So here's the deal. What I want you guys to do as a church is I'm going to give you some authority over this and score from one to seven, one being I'm very interested in learning that right now, and seven being that's the least thing I'm interested in right now. Score them because that's going to gauge how I go with these teachings. I want to give you some authority over it's not. I mean, I just think sometimes we make mistakes when the pastor goes and prays, comes back, this is what I want to teach you. These are areas I feel in my heart we need to teach. I want to give you authority over scoring them of when we want to start and, and that kind of thing. Does that make sense? So if you want to learn the book of Acts, put a one. If that's like your top, I want to learn that or the book of Luke or whatever. And so we're going to go with that, okay? So what I want to do is fill that out and leave it in the offering box on your way out. You can leave it in the offering box, the, the box out there, and, and feel free to leave more money in there too. Just saying. <laughs> Whenever it gets awkward, I get silent. I'm like, I'm just going to stare at you. Until you laugh, I am not moving on. I'm just kidding. When you behave yourself, I told you. I warned him. You can sit by my wife, but you got to be good. So score one to seven, and that'd be awesome. Okay? You good? Amen. Is that a good idea? Do you guys like that idea? You know? Um, so, and, uh, well, suggestions are down there. I forgot to tell you that. Thanks, Jeff, for being smart. But suggestions, if there's something that I didn't put on there, and you're like, hey, I really want to learn this, put that down there, and we'll take it under consideration. Here's the deal. Is you guys are the church, right? Me as your pastor, I want to serve you. I want to teach you what you, where your heart is. I want to meet you where you're at. And for three years, we've done what we had to do to survive. Let me tell you something. Now I'm ready to equip you, and you all become leaders. Imagine if everybody in here was a leader and went out and built the kingdom. What would happen? And that's where we need to go. Amen? So today, though, i got to move on with the renewal so I don't keep you too late. Um, we've been talking about renewing the mind. Romans 12, 2, Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. And how many of us look at our minds, and a lot of times we identify our mind as our brain, but our mind is separate from our brain. Otherwise, he would have said, renew your brain. Your mind is your soulish realm. It's your emotions. It's your personality. It's those kind of deals. He says, renew the mind. The mind will change the brain. The brain will change how we respond to circumstances. And, and I believe with all my heart, I see so many Christians go through so many battles that they would not go through if they would renew their minds in the Word. A lot of times when people come to me and they, and they want help, I always ask this when people ask me for help, is I say, what scripture are you standing on to believe for? Because that tells me you're actually reading the word to grow, to change, to get through your circumstance. If you don't have a sword, you can't fight. So renewing your mind in the word. So we went through that for a couple weeks, and it's been great. I've, seen, I've had some great responses and all that good stuff. But today I'm going to talk about something that is crucial to renewing our mind, and that is attitude. How many of you guys ever met someone with an attitude problem? Participation. Now, don't raise your hand if you're sitting next to the person you have an, that has an attitude problem. Mother and daughter, you can find them. You can always tell. You have an attitude. No, you have an attitude. Karen, when you were raising your kids, did you find any of them had more attitude than the other one? Tell me who. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You know what, I can believe that. I don't know him very well, but I know Raymond, and I can just tell. 
I have five kids. All of them have different personalities. All of them have different attitudes. When, and the scary ones are the ones that have my attitudes. You know? Ecclesiastes is where we're going to start, but we're going to spend most of our time today in Philippians, if you want to open up there, Philippians 4. But we're going to start with Ecclesiastes, because this talks about the wise, the wise person and the fool. Anybody in here ever met a fool? Don't raise your hand if they're next to you. But in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 2 through 3, it says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. But when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom, and he shows everyone that he is a fool. Attitude. Listen, when we talk about renewing our minds, I want to tell you something right now is our attitude is the paintbrush to our mind. It's what paints the picture in our minds. Our attitude is a reflection of the way our mind functions, but our attitude also can drive our mind. How we respond to something is what programs our mind to think this way. Fight or flight. How many of you guys ever met someone where your fight or flight was broken? Right? You met those people that are, I mean, I was talking to a lady the other day, you know, that, you know, we can, you can grow up in the same home, and you can have some people that grow up with circumstan- the same circumstances, some grow up fighters, some are flighters. And sometimes you have people that are stuck in between, and they're just paralyzed. They don't, how many of you guys, when you get afraid, you just, you freeze, you get paralyzed like a deer in headlights, like, what do I do with this? I mean, have you ever hit a deer? You ever wonder why, I mean, what are you thinking, deer, you know? I mean, I've watched them. I grew up in Michigan. Listen, right now in July, I guarantee if you were to drive down the road I grew up in, you would find deer carcasses all the way down the road. It was just normal. Hitting deer was like hitting mosquitoes are here. And, and you would find them. I remember one time I was driving my dad's truck and I hit a deer. Um, and my dad always told me, watch out for deer. And I used to get sick of hearing that. Like, what do you think I'm going to do? Deer! And drive towards it? it wasn't that redneck. But the deal is, so I hit a deer. I hit a six-point deer. had big antlers. And I drove the truck home because I smashed it, and I had to tell my dad I hit a deer. By the time I went back to the deer, someone already scalped it. I'm like, what are you going to do? That's your trophy? Found us on the side of the road. But the point is, you ever watch deer? They, you don't know what. Why are you standing in the middle of the road? Same thing goes for us. How many times do we have a circumstance going on, and our attitude puts us in a place of paralyzation? We don't fight, we don't flight, we don't accomplish nothing. That's where God says, don't be lukewarm, get off the fence. Attitude is a paintbrush to our mind. It programs the brain. We need to work joyfully. Listen, I'll tell you right now is we as Christians, as believers of Jesus, can live a very joyful life no matter what our circumstances are because God is God. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. He's on his throne. He's in our hearts. Greater is he who is in us than come against us. We have things to be happy about. But we walk around sometimes with bad attitudes. How many of you guys ever went to church and found it full of bad attitudes? You could be honest. That's right, not here. <laughs> Except for me, when I have a bad attitude. Number, I'm going to give you a couple points. Is we can live a fulfilled life. Philippians 4, verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. Now, I believe when Paul wrote these two scriptures we're going to give you, I believe he was writing to a church, and I don't know if you're like me, when I read the Bible, I see the personality of the writer coming out. I could tell, like, man, he had grit in that moment. Oh, man, he was being bold in that moment. I could just hear Paul's voice. He's writing to the Philippian church, and if you read the story, the Philippian church at this point had attitude. It's like when they wrote, he wrote the Corinthian church, they were just doing a lot of sinful things, and he's like, knock it off. And this one, he's writing about personality. And he says this in verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And I said this in Sunday school. And I'm not trying to be repetitive, but I said this in Sunday school. How many of you guys realize when he repeated it, that means something? How many of you guys ever got mad at your spouse or your children? Either one. You can go their direction. And you repeat yourself. He's pretty much just saying, Be happy. Just be happy. Rejoice. Just rejoice. I can see him in front of the church saying, will you just rejoice? Be happy. That's just me. That's how I'd handle it. I mean, today was great. How many of you guys enjoyed worship today? You rejoiced. How many of you guys realized the band could be amazing, but if you come in here with a dud in your head, you're not going to get anything done. You don't rejoice. The celebration of church is with the people. Sometimes they expect us to make them happy. What do you think? We're a clown? 
Look at guys, be happy. Rejoice. It's up to you to find the joyfulness in your own heart to celebrate. Speaking of that, quick commercial break, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock in the Kit Carson Church, we're having a night of worship. We usually have it the first Sunday of the, or first Wednesday of the month, but with Harvest we didn't. So next Wednesday, 7 o'clock, Kit Carson Church, we're just going to worship God. Amen? I told the band, run it. Let's worship. So be there at that time. It would be awesome. So back to the, what I'm saying is rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at your hand. Hey, we expect quiet babies in the church. Last time I went on an ambulance call, that's what Eric sounded like. <laughs> I love babies. We're not having any more. What was I saying? Rejoice. Lori's not pregnant. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at your hand. Let me give you four points real quick about how you can live a fulfilled life according to that scripture. Is first off, celebrate God. That's what he's saying, rejoice, celebrate God. When we come in the church, we're to worship God. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to be crucial on this, but as we, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to raise this church. I, I'm not, not me, God is going to do it, but I believe God is putting us in a direction of we're going to be a church full of leaders. We're going to change the world as, as leaders. In order to do that, that means you celebrate God regardless if the band is good or not because your own heart is already pure and holy and accepted. You yourself can worship no matter what you see. You come to church, you're already worshiping. You don't come in, and then you, I mean, I've seen it, people, too many songs today, just too many songs. Or you get the other half of the congregation, not enough songs, not enough songs. Well, sing your own songs. Sometimes we expect cue cards, we rely on cue cards too much. That's what words are on the screen. Sing this, sing this. But what if you came in celebrating with your own heart because God has done something amazing for you this week or you saw God move this week so you're already excited and you're singing your own songs, you're celebrating God because no matter where your circumstances are, guess what? God is still God and you can celebrate. Me and Lori and the kids were celebrating because Lori had a radical turnaround with her health with the help of a lot of folks. But I pray, we were praising God even when she was sick because God was worthy to be praised. I mean, there was times I didn't know if she was going to make it. I was still praising God. I'm going to praise you, Lord, I guess. I'm zipping up the body bag. I'm sorry, you're a good woman, Lori. Love you. She's like, wait, I'm still alive. I'm just kidding. Sorry, that was a bad joke. I'm, that was horrible. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. Winnie, behave. I blame you. But you celebrate God no matter what. You can find in every circumstance. It doesn't matter where your finances are, your health is, the trouble of people around you is, you can celebrate God. And if you celebrate God, you renew your mind that when negativity happens, we, your body has muscle memory, we're going to celebrate God anyways. But if you program your mind to constantly be negative, when good things happen, you don't see the good, you just see the shoe dropping. Because that's how you programmed your mind. Celebrate God. Lord used to tell me not too long ago, I'm going on this journey myself because I realized one day the Lord actually finally told me, you're a negative person. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And God's like, yeah, you are. But how many of you guys realize we can have two services on Sunday full of people. We can have great things going all over the county. Me and Lori, Lori could be the healthiest person in the world, but I could be programmed to see negativity everywhere. And if we're that kind of person, it's the way we programmed our mind. Celebrate God, it moves that aside to understand no matter what, God is God. The second thing is to live a prosperous life or a fulfilled life is add value to people. Add value to people. I started doing something I heard years ago of um, how to influence, how to, how is that? Win friends and influence people. I never read the book, but I got the concept. Right? Just like high school. I know. Biology. I got it. So I started actually going to people and I start, I'm trying to program myself when I walk up to someone to instantly add value to their life. We, as people, sometimes all we want to do is take value from people. Give to me. It's all about me. How many of you guys realize we have generations raising up that are scaring me to death because it's all about them? 
But what I'm trying to do is, as a man of God, as a pastor, as a community member, I want to add value to people's lives just by interacting with them. And that's what he's saying in the scripture. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. How many of you guys realize you're the possible person, you're one of the only people that people may see God in? And if we're just trying to take from people, that's not representation of God, that's representation of Satan. When we add value to people and we love them and we're compassionate, we care about them just the way they are, that's adding value and showing God. How many of you guys realize Jesus added value? Hello? And that's what he's saying, rejoice! Add value to people, quit being a baby. It's just the reality of it. So I'm trying to add value because it used to be all about me. It's hard, I'm gonna surprise you with this, but I grew up a very selfish person. Mind blown, right? <laughs> but the truth is, is that's the way it was. I'm trying to renew my mind that it's not about me, it's about other people. Guess what, this world isn't about you, your life isn't about you, it's about God, it's about Jesus Christ, you give it to him, it's not about you anyways. So add value to people. The third thing is, give God your concerns. How many of you guys have ever asked, like I said to Cisco, how many of you guys have ever asked someone how they're doing and you regret it 10 seconds later because you realize it's going to be a 10 minute conversation of vomit? Because, oh, this is all I got going on. I had a talk with my boy yesterday, Josiah, he's, a, he's grown up to be a great young man. And he, he has a good heart. And he saw one of his friends get hurt. And so I had to, I wanted to talk to him about it. So I sat him down and I was like, son, how are you doing with that? And he's like, oh, it's just so sad. It's just so, it, Cause our friend got his feelings hurt. And so what I taught him was this. I said, listen, you have such a good heart. This is what you need to do with that heart. When you see someone hurting like that, take it to God and pray about it. Cause God can change his heart. Take your concern, give it to God. Can you imagine if kids could get that concept right now? What their life will be like when they're older, when negativity comes, we still glorify God, we exalt God, we celebrate God, we add value to people because we're also praying about them and praying for them. Take your concerns. I can't tell you how many pastors get burned out because everybody's concerns is put on them. And then they don't know how to do the handoff either. Let me tell you something, I'm a great handoffer. I don't want to carry everybody's problems or my own. I'm learning to be a good handoffer. I had this talk with Lori too, because sometimes she carries people's burdens. And I look at her, last time I looked at her, I go, are you Jesus? Quit trying to pretend you are. Take the ball, hand it off. Here, Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in that person's life. Amen? How many of you guys realize, no matter what your concern is, God's bigger. And I gotta keep moving, but. The fourth thing is experience God's wholeness. Experience his wholeness. There's a book by James Allen that says, as a man thinketh, so is he. We all have heard that phrase. A man, but I want you guys to understand before we go to the next scripture in verse 8, is a man can alter his life by altering the way he thinks. I read a quote one time that says, if you don't like who you are, change your mind. And the older I get, the more I study scripture, I realize that's actually a true statement. If you don't like who you are, change your mind. I used to be someone who didn't know who, I didn't know who I was at all. I always pretended to be somebody else, Sue. I was a chameleon. You ever met with a chameleon? That's what I was. I'd be whoever else I was around. That's who I am. And then all of a sudden I got a revelation and now this is what you get. Am I getting dressed for church today? Literally you can ask Lori. I was like, do I wear the dark jeans or the lighter jeans? That's really my conversation. Her conversation was make sure to put a shirt on. Just kidding. But Philippians 4.8, here we go. This is mental floss. If you're taking notes, you need to put notes in your thing. If you write mental floss down, because that's what this is. How many of you guys ever floss your teeth? Raise your hand if you don't, because I won't want, no, I'm just kidding. How many of you guys wish you had mental floss and you could just walk around with someone and they're being negative, you could just floss their, get that out of there. Right? This is what the scripture is. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Go back again to what I was saying. Picture this in your mind. I mean, Paul's writing letters here to the church, right? So just imagine, he's, just, he's probably just, I could just see him frustrated, like, 
And you guys have been there, right? You're just like, whatever's, just, just think of the good stuff. Anything good happen today? He's saying to the church, whatever's true, focus on that. Don't worry about the lies. I can just see the desperation when I'm reading this. Whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's pure. And eventually he's like, if there's anything praiseworthy, just do that. Right? How many of us ever met those folks? Or oh, we've been that person. Everything is negative. You can't renew your mind and hold on to the negative stuff. Listen, we're, we were born into sin. We're born into a fallen world. We're born into problems. But guess what? You have Jesus. Get over it. Move on. Celebrate God. Add value to people. Build the kingdom. Worst case scenario, you one day will die and be in heaven. That's something that, even if you're in your worst point, you can think, well, at least one day I'm going to be in heaven. I don't know if you're going to be there, but I will. I'm just kidding. But the point is, is that's the case. Just pray, find something praiseworthy. I want to give you four more points. Is that okay? And then what will be done is four things people with great attitudes possess. How many of you guys like to learn things? And if there's something, that, if there's something successful people have that I don't have, I want to learn what it is. Well, these points I got from John Maxwell. Four points that people with good attitudes have. So number one is a teachable spirit. A teachable spirit. How many of you guys have ever met someone that knows everything? You're pointing at me? It's true. <laughs> but how many of you guys, seriously, you met someone, you can't teach them, you can't explain something, you can't, they're getting ready to walk off a cliff, but they know better than you and you can't share with anything different. Anybody ever seen those people? You ever met them in church? It happens. People with good attitudes have a teachable spirit. They have a teachable spirit. I'll use Jamie Crockett as an example. Is that okay? I've never met someone that's so laid back as Jamie. He's so laid back, he could be asleep. Right? I know inside you're, you're, you're tormented. I get it. I've, I've talked to you. But on the outside, he's just like Jamie. He's like laid back. Laid back. But what I love about Jamie is no matter what's going on, I can speak into his life and he seems to adapt. He takes something and he learns it. Listen, I don't know everything like when he thinks I do, but take my advice and take it to the Word. If it's not in the Word, don't take my advice. But the truth of the matter is, is have a teachable spirit. It keeps us with a good attitude. Because there is things, my pastor told me one time, he says, Scott, I'm going to tell you what your greatest trait is. And I, I needed a good trait at that point because I, I have a lot of messed up things in my life. Because let me tell you what I like about you. When you don't know something, you will use every resource you can to learn to get through something. Because I learned right away, I don't want to stay the same. I don't. For example, where we're at as a pastor in church relationship is we got a healthy base of 50 or so people. That's where we're at. We just, in three years, how many guys ways that's successful? 50 some people in three years, that's awesome. But now I know I'm using every resource I can to blow past that and, and save more souls and make more disciples and keep building God's kingdom. That's just where I'm at. I don't want to stay the same. Lori went through that huge sickness for a number of years. And Joe and Rhonda helped learn things and we learned things and we prayed and all this kind of stuff. I don't want to go back there. So you know what? I'm using every resource I can to make sure we don't go back there. Teachable spirit. Nothing's worse than meeting with someone in office trying to talk to them and they know everything. So why are they even there? But a good attitude is someone who possesses a teachable spirit. Paul wrote that scripture as, brethren, learn these things. Meditate on these things. Learn them. Because guess what, guys? No matter what you're going through, you think of good things, you praise God, you exalt the King of Kings, it's going to change how your mind responds. It'll change your brain's thinking. It'll change your body. It'll change your life. Because bad things won't get you down anymore. Number two is, Take responsibility for your attitude. People that possess great attitudes take responsibility for their attitudes. How many of you guys ever heard this? I'm so sorry, but. Right? A common trait for every man that's ever abused his wife. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have did that. Don't get me to that point of anger. Or you can take attitude for your own responsibility of your own attitude. Nobody can change your attitude but you. Right? I tell my kids all the time is this, is like, listen, I mean, how many guys raise, I mean, Karen, you raise kids? Everybody's raised kids in here. It's, how many of you guys ever heard this? They punch, you, someone, all of a sudden you hear, ah! 
And then everybody's storming down the stairs as lawyers. They put suits on with briefcases. I'm coming down, I'm going to just, you know, right? Because every kid is a lawyer. <laughs> and then, you're like, so did you punch it? Yes, I punched the person. But they did this. Right? They did this. So they're always justified in their punching. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could just punch everybody and justify it? Like, hey, you looked at me weird. But that's what kids do. But let me tell you, this is what I train my kids to do is listen. Someone might do you wrong. You can't control that. All you can control is how you think and respond to what they did. That's on you. So the bigger trouble that comes down for consequence is the person who reacted with a punch. Does that make sense? We can only take responsibility for our own attitudes. Take it. Run with it. Change it. If you wake up as Debbie Downer, don't take your family with you. If you're in the Titanic seeking of emotions, put your family on a lifeboat and go sink on your own if you're going to sink. Or start praying and treading water and find out you can swim. Number three is meditate on good things. Meditate on good things. <laughs> I was thinking about my dad the other day. My dad used to work carpentry. And what he would do is he always made his lunch, right? And every single lunch was bologna sandwiches. And I'm not a bologna fan. I had just never been able to figure out what bologna is. So I've chosen not to put it in my belly. <laughs> but uh, there's a story I heard of a guy who was on his lunch break, building a skyscraper, was sitting on one of those beams and was taking lunch and opens up his lunch box, starts pulling out, and he's like, I can't believe bologna again. Every lunch, blowny, <coughs> excuse me, blowny, blowny, blowny. All I ever get is blowny. His friend finally looked at him and was like, well, you know, you could ask your wife to make something different. You know, turkey, ham. You know, just ask her. I'm sure she would. I make my own lunch. <laughs> but isn't that true? Most of the blowny in our life was put there by us. Nobody else can make us bologna sandwiches. We make our own bologna sandwiches. And then we complain about our bologna sandwiches. But if you could meditate on good things, in 24 hours of a day, why, was, why is it the bad moments that overpower our whole day? It doesn't have to be that way. We can meditate on the great things. I used to complain. How many of you guys ever complain about bills? Right, you go to the mailbox, bill, 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 bill. Why is someone rebuked me because so I was mad about my cell phone bill, and they're like, look, praise God for that bill because that means you have a phone. Right? How I, it's a mind shift. Like, whoa, really? Thank God for the bill. Praise the Lord for mortgages. Right? Or praise God for car insurance. But yet, I do praise God because praise God, for a year now, we've lived in our house. Find the good things and meditate on those because God has blessed us. And I want to end on, well, two more. I want to end on this, though. Number three is travel the high road. If people that possess a great attitude travel the high road. Let me break this down for you. Good, God chooses where we travel. Here's an example. Is God called me to Cheyenne County. He's like, this, God, this is where you're going. I had a vision to do what I want to do, but God says, this is where you're going to do it. Here's my deal. I could have came here kicking and screaming, complaining about drought and nothing and, and, and dead trees and dead grass and, and, and dead people. I'm just kidding. Sorry, that was a joke. Bad joke. Calm down. But I could have, I could have but I didn't. God chooses where we travel. We choose how we get there. I choose to come here with expectation that God put me here because he's going to do something awesome in Cheyenne County and throughout eastern Colorado. I believe he wants to start a fire of revival that can change a whole nation, and it could actually start in Cheyenne County. So it's my choice how I get there. All of you have the same choice. Take the high road. Let me give you an example of this. The low road is we treat others worse than they treat us. Let me tell you something. There's people in the kingdom of God that calls themselves Christians that does this. 
I'm going to treat you worse than you can treat me because I'm going to keep you away from me so you don't hurt me. It's the way we programmed our minds to think. The middle road is we treat people the same as they treat us. I'm going to tell you, that, I'm going to just be honest, I think that's even wrong. We should treat people better than they treat us. It's easy to love people, like the Bible says, it's easy to love people that love you. Love those who don't. Right? I used to have friends. I don't anymore, but I'm working on it. When I lived in Michigan when I was a kid, I was just riding bikes all over town. I had a little biker gang. I did not roll a gang, but we just rode around me sick Michigan. That's what we did. And I remember one time, I mean, I was trying to show the love of God to these people. That was my excuse for hanging out with them. I was I'm going to bring them to the Lord. <clears throat> but I was just a kid, and I, I kept talking to him about prayer and God, and da 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 da. Well, there was also some other bullies that used to tackle us, knock us off our bikes, and hurt us, and abuse us, and all kinds of stuff. So one day, my friend goes, let's pray for them. I'm like, whoa, really, we're going to pray for them? Yes, we're going to pray for them. We circle up, we begin praying, my friend's leading it, and he's like, I mean, he, and this is his prayer, Lord, I pray as he's riding home, he'll blow a tire and roll his bike off of a ditch, and hit his head, and when he hits his head, he'll think about how he treated us. Amen. I left there thinking, I'm not ready for this kind of job. <laughs> but, but that's the way Christians are sometimes. We compartmentalize people, treat people, people with good attitudes that live a prosperous life, they treat people better than they're treated. And the last thing I'll say is this, is understand the value of attitude. We need to understand the value of our attitudes. If we're going to renew our minds in the Word of God, if we're going to transform our lives through the way we think and live, we've got to understand the value of your own attitude. Because what you're doing is you're walking around, a lot of us walk around with bad attitudes. Let me tell you something, how many of you guys can recognize areas of your thought process that are negative, that was put there because of a, way, a circumstance that happened to you? Maybe it was the way someone said, like, hey, you're not good enough, you're never going to be good enough, or something negative then how many guys can also think about the fact that you have said those things to other people that have caused the things that they're trying to pray through? Our attitude is key to everything. And we need to understand, because here's the deal, is what we appreciate, appreciates. It gains value. What we complain about, we will never obtain. The only way that we can succeed in our life is to understand this, is be thankful for what we have, have a good attitude, praise God, exalt him. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's breathed life into you. He's breathed life into your families. There's something good that we can celebrate with God at all times, no matter what our circumstances are. But I'm going to tell you right now is if you will change your mind with your attitude and your prayer and the word, your circumstances will become smaller. The problem in your circumstances will become smaller because you'll recognize how big God really is. Because he's bigger than your problems. He's bigger than your situations. Some of you guys are praying for family members to come to know the Lord and have breakthroughs in their lives. And it's important for you to keep a good attitude and celebrate God always. Because I've been there. And I've seen miracles happen with family when they recognize, when they look at you and see Jesus in your attitude and in your life, it'll change their life. Amen? I actually went over a little bit over 12 for some of you guys. Are you, you okay? I'm going to have the band come back real quick, if that's okay. We won't take long. You can leave if you need to leave. I want to do this. This is what I feel to, to end with, if that's all right. <clears throat> it would be easier if I could play guitar, but I just can't. It would be easier if I could sing, but I just can't. I'm going to close with this. Oh, if you can do Freedom Reigns again. I believe some of you guys in here, you have areas that you're praying through. You're trying to pray through. You have areas of your life that you're trying to keep a good attitude about. You have areas of your life that are a struggle and you don't understand. You know, you're, just, you're not getting through it the way that you feel like you should be able to get through it but based on what you know about God and the Word of God. There's always limitations in our mind. 
And the, and the deal is this, is I've shared this before, but I want to share it again. I just feel it's important. As I remember praying for my dad when I was just out of high school. Now, I prayed for my dad every single Sunday, every single Sunday for probably 10 years for salvation. I, went up to, I mean, he was a violent alcoholic. I remember going to the altar every single Sunday and praying for him. And then I got away from that, and I became an alcoholic myself through high school. But when I got out of high school, I remember my, the Lord woke me up one night, about 2.30 in the morning. And he says, I want you to go for a walk, and I want you to pray for your dad. So I went for a walk, and I'm warring with my voice. I'm praying to the Lord. I'm praising God. I'm praying for my dad's salvation. But I never once said, dad, I never said this, though. I never said, God, please save my dad. I said, Lord, thank you for my dad's salvation. I praise you for his life change. I praise you for what you're going to do. And that night, the Lord spoke to me clear as day. He says, you'll never have to pray for him again. I was probably 23 at that time, 22, 23. And at 30, when I was 33 years old, the Lord told me, I was living here in Colorado, he says, Scott, I want you to go home and talk to your dad. This is the week. This is the week. I bought a plane ticket. I flew to Michigan just to, for that sole purpose. I went to the garage he was working on one day, and I just said, Dad, I said, I think you've been taught a whole lot wrong about God. Let me tell you the truth about Jesus and his love for you. And I just talked to him. By the end of the conversation, I said, Dad, if you want to receive Christ before if you want to receive Christ before I fly home, I want you to ask me. I'm like, all right. Week goes by. They, now is the day I'm flying home. And I'm in the shower. I'm like, Lord, it's you, man. It's not me. So I talked to God. Man, it's up, it's up to you, bro. I'm just but, he, but I remember going out, pouring my coffee. My mom's sitting at the table, and my dad says, You want to pray with me? I want to receive the Lord. And my mom was like, what? This kind of speech, like she literally had eyes this big. She's like, I don't know what's going on here, but this is weird. But I prayed with him. My dad verbally received Christ that day. When I was driving to the airport, the Lord says, my dad was only 62 at that time. The Lord says to me when I was driving to the airport, he says, your dad will make it one more year and he'll be home with me. I remember hearing that thinking, he's only 62, but I also remember thinking, I wasn't sad, I wasn't heartbroken, I was celebrating. And literally a year later, my dad died. It was bad. But I was able to know that he's in heaven. Now why am I telling you all this? Because all the negativity that was in my mind for years, put there by verbal abuse of an alcoholic father, didn't allow my, I didn't ever, I didn't allow my attitude and my emotions to give up. So an attitude reflects the love of God. And there, there's people in here right now that have an area that you're trying to get through that you don't understand. And I believe today as we close with this song, I want you to do the prayer that I did for my father. I want you to praise him that freedom reigns in your mind. Freedom reigns in your emotions. Whatever circumstance you're trying to get through, God is already through it. Because what happens is we as Christians think we pray about it and we're supposed to, but then we get a bad attitude and we don't see the results. Does this make sense? And so we're going to turn over to worship now. We just pray over you. If you need to go, you're welcome to go. I mean, it's, it's past time for what we try to allow. But if you want to stay and praise the Lord during this song, there's a circumstance you need to give to God. But can I say this to you? If you give the circumstance to God, but not your attitude, it does nothing for your circumstance. That makes sense. You give God the circumstance, but you also give him your attitude. Amen? Father God, let's pray over this right now. Lord, I just turn it over to you. I pray, Lord, that freedom reigns in this place because of you, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So I pray right now as we turn this over to you, as we sing this song one more time today, let it be like communion for us. Let it be life-changing. Let your Holy Spirit reign in our hearts in whatever area of our hearts that we've been praying through, family members' salvation, finances, our own afflictions. I pray, Lord, one thing. Let us renew our minds in your word today by worshiping you. We celebrate God today. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is 
his freedom. And the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven. Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So this week, when you leave here, put some of these things into practice. When you brush your teeth and you floss your teeth, also floss your brain, floss your mind. Replace it with good things, amen, and, and always have an attitude check, and I believe God will change your lives. Every day, celebrate God. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you. High five your neighbor. Next week, we're here again, but Wednesday, 7 o'clock at Carson Building, a night of worship. God bless you. Potluck style meal before at 5.30. Bring your best food.